Scene one, Apple, take one. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome into Oops Caught Me Smoking, and thank you for clicking that play button. And we have a very special, special episode today. I have the dab rig out. I got Luca all nice and clean. Well, as clean as I can get it. The stem does not want to come clean. But anyways, that's about as clean as I can get him for today. And and I know you guys are like, Dan, what's so special about today? Well, I have a very special guest. That's why. Um, Mr. John Estine. But it's also our 50th episode. Yay! We made it to episode 50, you guys. And thank you. Thank you very much for everyone that listens and supports the show. And again, just real quick, I'm going to do a celebratory dab, and then I'm going to roll the beautiful weed footage. But before that, go check out oopscaughtmesmoking.com. Yes, it is official. We are official. Oopscaughtmesmoking.com. Watch, listen, shop, all in the same spot. I know that's kind of what a website's for, but for us podcasters, it's it's a big step. So thank you, everyone. Go out there, oopscaughtmesmoking.com. Put your email in. Let's be be my smoke buddy to join the newsletter. That way you get updates and all information when it comes up, when it is available. Now, with that being said, 50th episode, episode, 50th episode, celebratory. Damn. Yeah. Let's break out. Let's break out the torch. But first, I'll show you guys what I'm, smoking, what I'm dabbing. This is mitten extracts. Can you guys see that? I don't know if you can see that. Uh, mm-hmm. Mitten extracts. Sorry, guys. Camera's not focusing. But anyways, it's called mitten extracts. It is 78% THC. You're going to try to see the. There you go. Mm-hmm. Live rosin, mm, butter. Okay, now that you saw it, now we play with fire. Go. Nice and hot, nice and hot. Brand new dab rig, brand new dab rig. Let's do it. Roll that beautiful weed footage. Many note that this strain is good for relieving stress, anxiety, and chronic pain. Upon sparking up and taking that first hit, expect your worries and woes to melt away. Not only will you be feeling great, but you'll also have the sweet aftertaste of candy in your mouth from the smoke. You'll likely feel euphoric and happy, but not enough to leave the house. After a sesh you're going to want to find a sofa or bed to stretch out and relax on, as your physical pains melt away and your mind expands. We 
have a special smoke. So we have a special smoke session today. Today we have Mr. John Estine. And for the people who don't know who you are, Mr. John Estine, go ahead and tell the people who you are and where you're from and what you're about. Okay. Um, I'm John Estine. I'm from um, New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, basically, I'm here because of my story. Uh, I was sentenced to 150 years here in Louisiana. I did my time in Angola mm -hmm. uh, prison. At one time, it was one of the most bloodiest prison in the world. Uh, yes, it was. Yes, it was. And uh, drug charge, nonviolent. And it kind of shocked a lot of people's senses to see that I was sentenced to 150 years. They gave me four counts. It ran a while. They could have ran it together, but they want to make an example out of me. So, therefore, mm -hmm. they gave me the most time possible. If they could have gave me life, that I would have had life sentence. But 150 years is practical life anyway. So, yes. getting me off the streets was what their main objective was and not to have me back on the streets. But here I am. I'm back. <laughs> right. So, yeah, exactly. And so. it's... It's good to have you back there, buddy. But I want to I want to go back a little bit now. When you grew up in like we'll say uh, like uh, a suburb, kind of like middle class, middle yes. class suburbs. Okay, and you grew up in Louisiana. Am I correct? Yes, I grew up um, actually. Yes, I grew up like more in the countryside of um, New Orleans on the West Bank. Um, I was raised in uh, Avondale, Louisiana. My okay. family from the Seventh Ward of New Orleans, and it's right there next to the Ninth Ward. I mean, it was actually is a pretty bad town at one particular time. Okay, but uh, I never uh, actually experienced that because I was real young. My parents took up and more moved over there to Avondale. I was like nine years old. Okay, and uh, that's when I got into playing sports and everything. So I really got in, uh, really. Middle class family, um, never really understood the uh, bad living actually, because I grew up in a mixed neighborhood, so I had the best of wo um, both worlds. So yeah, I yeah. That... Struggled my mind actually when uh, I was real young, single parent until I was nine years old. She met my stepfather. You know, that's when he moved us to Avondale, Louisiana, give us a better life, put us in Catholic schools. My me and my two little sisters. Uh, so, uh, only yeah. thing that I, uh, only thing that I pretty much regret was that I never, I never uh, got the chance to to see my friends. That when I was young, when my parents moved, I always wonder how they're doing. You know, so mm -hmm. the only thing came stay in my mind still today, still today, I wonder how they, how they, how they um are doing. You know, what they're doing today. That's right. Sir. Yeah, it's yeah, for, uh, being a kid and just moving from like one town to another, knowing mm -hmm. that it's probably going to be a safer environment environment for you, mm -hmm. but still leaving your friends behind and everything, that's quite difficult to do. I also did, I also moved, I think it was my sophomore year in high school, and mm -hmm. like I left a lot of relationships behind and went on to like a different, a different city, and you know built my life from there but we're not here to talk about me so <laughs> now, now uh, you yeah. graduated high school and all that stuff and, yes. and you went mm -hmm. on to the peace corps am i correct yeah i went to uh i joined the army national guard national guard my bad mm -hmm. i'm sorry yes. yes so i joined okay. that actually reason the reason why i joined the army national guard really to offset the cost of college so um Prior to graduating, two years prior to graduating, I went to I went to Catholic school for all my educational years. Okay. When I transferred from uh, my junior senior to public school, the courses wasn't college preparatory. So therefore, when I went to college, I couldn't get a full scholarship because I had to take a remedial courses to catch up. You see. Okay. Yeah. And. So I couldn't, so I'm trying to be smart and wise, you know, so I said, well, I really don't have, my family don't have the money to send me to college and I had a partial scholarship to play football. So I guess I go to military, they'd, they'd, they'd pay the rest of it. So which they did, everything worked, worked as planned. Okay. 
Um, nice. But when I get there, I wind up trying out for the team. Uh, I caught the ball one time. I almost ran it back with a touchdown and they start in um return team. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they gave I wanted to get in the full scholarship anyway. So oh, nice. the Army National Guard was in vain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, but as a result of me um, joining um, Army National Guard, I didn't you know nobody, nobody can see the future, but uh they had uh, deployed me mm-hmm. to uh, war, um Saudi Arabia. Okay. Yeah. Now this was a Desert Storm. That's Desert Storm, 1990, okay. 1991. That's okay. right, sir. Yep, my mm-hmm. uncle, my uncle Brent was actually in Desert Storm. Also, he was stationed in in uh, Baghdad, I believe. Wow. Okay. Yep. Right, right in the mix of it. Mm. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yep. But uh, yeah. yeah, it was. I remember my grandmother just up all night watching the news and just seeing the the night vision of like all of the missiles and the bullets and everything just flying around and. Because back then they showed that stuff like on CNN and NBC mm-hmm. and ABC. They actually showed the Desert War on TV. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't like people getting blown up and killed. It was just pretty much just a bunch of like night vision and like tracers going around. Mm-hmm. And I just remember my grandmother up mm-hmm. all night just crying her eyes out. Just not because uh, my uncle couldn't he couldn't just pick up a phone and call. You know, he's in the middle of a fucking war. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was. Yeah, so it was pretty much her just worrying the entire time, and then when he came back home, he surprised us all, and it was a heartfelt man, a heartfelt thing, and all that. Exactly. But uh, but yeah, so you grad, so you graduated high school, you go on to the army, the army reserves, and you're you're deployed out into uh, hell, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now. Uh, now, uh, like, I don't want to say cool war stories because nothing about war is cool. But it, is there anything like interesting stories that happened to you while you were there? Well, um, interesting. I wouldn't. It was a different experience. That's for sure. Right. It, was, it was a life. It was life. It was a life changing experience for me. Um, other than that, um, um, the being bombed. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't exciting but it was it was life changing because you never knew uh, if it's, if he was going to get blowed up or not right if blown yeah. up if get blown we sitting in ever saw a, a annex cart like a, a box cart like a train box cart yep well that's what we had that's what we lived in all oh, they wow. did was cut windows in it so put ac we in a desert mhm we we'll run off of generators and you cannot see out Right. So we bomb you all times of the night. You sit in this in this box cart, hoping with chemical suit on, just hoping that hope they don't hit, you know they don't. I want to uh, patriot missile don't miss the scud and it come and hit us or the frat right. are blowing up and come flying through the you know through the walls and and kill you or whatnot. So at this point in time, I think I believe in my heart. That this was the trigger point of me um, kind of sw- flipping a switch mentally. Okay, yep. Because that's when I got to the point where I didn't care anymore. Okay. See, F everything. Uh, whatever happened, happened. I'm tired. They bomb me all night and I'm tired of getting up. And I got to the point where I stopped getting up, putting a chemical suit on. So the guys that that was, so we had other th- three other guys and the anglers caught with me. Mm-hmm. And they had their chemical suit on, looking at the, looking at me, saying, "Man, look, we think we we think you need to get up and put your chemical suit on, man, like that." So I put it on because of them, you know. They they persuaded me to uh, it's the right thing to do, you know. Don't you know? But um, at that point, it didn't matter, you know, because I got stopped. I, I got tired of worrying, you mm-hmm. know, thinking about family, and you know, it was crazy. Yeah, yeah. Like at at some point, you gotta think like. What is this chemical suit going to save my life if you know a exactly. bomb drops on us? Like it's kind of like it's kind of like a, a bomb expert trying use wearing a bomb suit trying to uh, to disarm mm-hmm. a nuclear bomb. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter if it, it goes matter. off. You're not going to feel a thing. <laughs> not going to feel a thing. 
exactly. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Yeah. Now, right. uh, I was uh, I was like uh, picking my nose into some of your past interviews that you were doing, and okay. I heard something about you keeping scorpions as a pet. Man, you you man, you you did some good research. <laughs> I, <laughs> I do my homework. I Kobe you, man. I Kobe you. I about that. <laughs> you know that kept that was my my buddies there. You know, it kept me grounded and rooted while I was over there. You know, so mm-hmm. it's like I had a shoe box. I put the sand in the shoe box, and I put like a net over it, and I tacked it down with with, with tacks. Okay. It had like three or four of them in there. They're solid black scorpions, man. They were cool, man. Cool. <laughs> I kept them in the I kept them in the annex court we lived in. You know, we had our little furniture in there. And I kept them on top of a little plate, a little like a little little what we kept our furniture at, like a little uh what you call that? What you put your clothes in, hanging up in there, it's like a little like a little cubby? A little cubby, yeah. Something okay. to that. So, yeah. It wasn't nothing, you know, and um and the guys, you know, they kind of Kind of got scared. They they couldn't sleep. I, I guess, and they kind of came together against me. Like, and they talked to me. Said, "Man, look, I understand you like you little scorpions and everything, but how about if you just keep them outside? You know, at <laughs> night when they're sleeping, because we it's, what if they fall off and you know they sting us and all that." Said, so, "Okay, man." So I kept them uh, outside, and I just put little insects in there for them to eat. But it was cool, man. It was. It was pretty cool, man. You know, um, you I got to the point where, one? huh? Did yeah, one ever sting you? No, never stung me. No, no, oh, no. Oh wow! No, they didn't sting me. Um, I got to the point where I put them in. I tried to bring them home. Oh, <laughs> I tried to bring them <laughs> home, man. I tried to bring them home, and uh, I put them in a soap case, a soap uh-huh. dish case, and I, I put holes, poke holes in it. And I put tape on the ends and I put it in my cargo pockets. Okay. You feel? And I had them in there. I had them, you know, two two of them in each each um soap dish. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> you had two live scorpions in soap boxes in your cargo pockets of your pants, trying to get out of play. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, awesome. Oh, that's awesome. great. <laughs> oh. That's awesome. The only reason, the only reason I didn't bring them, you know, with me is because uh, they had made a uh, the the ranking officers. I guess there was it couldn't check check everybody down, so they kind of like made an open uh, announcement saying that if anybody have anything or bring anything on this plane with them that don't belong, and we find out. Then when we check y'all, y'all gonna stay over here another another tour. Oh fuck that! <laughs> I love my scorpions. I love them, but I ain't love them that much. <laughs> right? I don't love so you I that much. Them. Stay here. Fuck that shit. <laughs> so I took them out of my cargo pocket. That took my knife and out. Broke that tape open. Opened up. Let them go, man. You know, and my buddies. They they kept me the whole. It was like six and a half months over there. So I had them by at least four four of those months. I had them. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That's that's crazy. Yeah, I had I had to get you to tell that story. I thought I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I was like, no way. But uh okay. Now yeah. you you come home from uh you come home from being deployed and yeah. how how do you get how do you get caught up in uh drug smuggling? Okay. Um I mean I don't give on. me like the how to, you know, but <laughs> just like how you did. <laughs> Right. I come home and I I tried to work at my mom. My mother was working for the lady who owns the Jefferson um, Downs and Fairgrounds, the horse tracks. Okay. My mom uh, was like a buyer, a personal buyer for they She always find different deals and and she ran a lot. She did a lot of business for the lady. And when I came home, she kind of hired me, my sister, my, my future wife at the time. Um, to do like landscaping, mm-hmm. beautify the place, put the flowers and stuff like that. So it was like it was pretty cool working for miles. So I really had too much to worry about. But at the same time, things got tight later down the line for me. Okay. You know, I was living in the condo and with my uh, my girlfriend, 
will soon to be wife and trying to make things work and you know come from war you know in my mind i changed but not knowing i changed you know right. so i couldn't really hold a job like talking about because i couldn't really take orders from anybody directly i felt right. just in, within myself like i was angry you know i always leech out to people so mm -hmm. so it was best for me to work for my mom <laughs> right but, can't but back talk mom yes <laughs> yes <laughs> But I had some friends that was into the drug game and they found that I was home. They, they, they drove to where I was working at one day and pull out knots of money. Uh, you know, man, why don't you come? They called me Bootsy. I grew up with the name, nickname Bootsy. Mm -hmm. And I uh, said, Bootsy, why don't you come, man, and make some real money, you know, like that. But it's, that was new to me. I never never did mess with drugs before in my life. I don't know what drugs are, you know? So I said, quite natural. I said, nah, I ain't gonna mess with that, man. I'm just gonna work, you know? He said, okay, mm -hmm. man, no problem, no problem. But he said, here's my here's my, here's my, my number, man. If you need anything, just call me, you know? Change your mind, just holler at me. I'm just phone call away like that. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, cool. But never thought I'd use that number. But things got really tough on me. You know, I really wanted a, a better life for me and my uh, future wife. Yep. Yeah. So I decided to call him. One day I was sitting in the condo, we was living in the condo in New Orleans East, and I called him and he answered the phone right away. Like like he was waiting on my call. <laughs> <laughs> like it's about time, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah, he was, you know, Spanish guy, you know, I grew up with, you know, so, and uh, he said, he said, he said, que paso, bato? I said, what's up, man? He said, uh, he said, meet us such such, you know, so I met him. And um, I, I never was really selling drugs at that time. I was just mm -hmm. hanging out with them, watching them do what they do. Right. Then eventually, you know, our whole stuff, they were pretty much using me. You know, I was holding drugs and stuff like that for them. I like, you know, a safe house for them. You mm -hmm. know, I get paid to do that. So I was making money like that. So that was easy money for me. You know? Right. So, um. But it got to the point where he said, man, look, man, if you want to make extra money, if somebody, you know, somebody who wants to buy anything, just let us know and sell it, make your money. I said, cool. That's, you know, uh, cool. But that was, when he said that, that was shortly after that mm -hmm. is when I, I caught my first charge. <laughs> you know, first charge. Because I was holding like 20 kilos of cocaine in my closet for the guy. Damn. Yes, yes. I was just holding that much, you know, and uh, he trusted me with that. So, you know, you know, we grew up together. So really, he knows my whole family. So he didn't, you know, you know, type of person I was. I ain't, I was green to all that. I was a loyal person. So, mm -hmm. who much, I mean, I'm, you know, who else better to hold your drugs than, than me? You know? Right. And uh, so. Uh, so the first time, the very first kilo that I went to sell was a half. The guy wanted a whole kilo, but I had another friend who wanted another half that his friend wanted. And I I kind of put my original guy, my friend, oh, aside, said, no, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna give you a half because I got, I'm, I'm gonna give you, I'm not gonna give you the whole one, I'm gonna give you just a half. I'm, I'm trying to make extra money, you know, right. I'm trying to get another clientele, I'm trying to, show the guy my friend that i can move some of this stuff you know so he can trust me with more and do my own thing <laughs> deal with yep. he was trying to save himself he got busted i don't know nothing about none of that so he's working with the feds to work his time off and turn me into the guy you see and uh -huh. i went to do the deal and long story short i'm in handcuffs right <laughs> Yeah, you know, so they're trying to find out where I'm getting it from. What you know, that's all they got from me. So I wound up sending word and tell them to go get the rest of the drugs from my my closet, and I gave their drugs back to them. I was good, you know. Right. Do my little time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow, wow. So then you end. So you end up on your second charge. You end up getting a uh, hundred and fifty years in prison. Now for a non-violent drug charge. Yes, that's my second charge, man. I was, I was like, I was spooked. I was scared after I did the first. So it took me about three years even to even 
get back into the drug game. Okay. You know, I really didn't really learn the drug game the first time. Right. I'm just, I'm still just jumping off the porch, you know. So, um, so I got, I'm working. I'm married now, you know. Uh, so I'm providing for my family. I got a good job. I'm actually working for her stepdad. So, I'm doing, so I kind of raised up in the ranks a couple of years working. I've, I've been getting raises, and every time they ask somebody if they want to learn how to do this, and I raise my hand, and I say, I'll learn. So I learned how to do the cherry pick. I learned how to get on a similar line, how to fiberglass boats, because we're dealing with boats. You know, the, this company was building uh, like uh, 55 foot rescue boats for the Coast Guard. They were okay. building boats, the shell. They built from from the shell on up. They were fiberglass and putting the keel in and the rudder. I would learn how to learn how to do all that. You oh, see? nice. So I was doing that, but, but at the same time, it had some Spanish guys working there, and the owner of the place were two Cuban twin brothers. Okay. So it had, of course, you gonna have some Spanish guys working there. So you know, so I got the they got to know me over the years, like a year, two years, going on three years, and they found out what I went to jail for. Okay. So they pulled me. They caught me at the tool room. Both them, one worked in the tool room, the other one on the on the floor with me. Mm -hmm. And they, when I went to put my tools up this particular, day, I remember like yesterday, man. And uh, he he asked me. He said, "Man, I heard you um did some time." I said, "I wasn't." The guy knew that the owner knew I did time, so they hired me knowing this. And my mm -hmm. my father in law is a farmer there, so I'm yeah, I, I did draw. Yeah, I did time for. You, do you mind me asking why? I said, "Yeah, for drugs." For drugs, okay. he said, "Man, um, if you were ever, would you think about think doing that again? Ever, you know, like that?" And I said, "Wow." I said, "I said no immediately." Cause I was like, "I ain't going there." But by me knowing the guy, I said, "Well, why? Why you ask?" Now that I opened that door, I opened that yep. door. For me. He had a lot of marijuana. He stopped giving me marijuana, and it was too high for I didn't know. Cause I was gone for almost three, well, three and a half years. So the, the the prices had spiked big time. I ain't know. So I just grabbed it for that price. Thought it was good, you know. So, but um, that was the start. After I left him alone, cause I couldn't really move it. And once I moved all this stuff for him, I couldn't. I said I, I want to leaving that job offshore. Okay. So I want to get on a boat with like nothing but pain and manias. It's called seismograph. Doing okay. seismograph work. So deep. So they coast off the um, out of Texas. The boat was off of, out of Texas. Um, so we had like a day before the boat go to, um, before they launch. So we go in town, and in, 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 I guess uh, what part of Texas this is? Right there, we had to catch the ferry to go over there. Uh, I can't think of the name of the part. It's right in it's outside of Houston, anyway. Okay. But anyway, we in town, so. We're driving us and two guys driving they were from dominican republic and you uh, know so uh so i'm just chilling we go like first second third street fourth street that's how that's how it was you know was set up in you know, the, the neighborhood okay and i saw this guy pull up the red light bars and he jamming he got long hair mexican rings all on his finger he's just jamming i'm looking not I, I know the look <laughs> so <laughs> I told the guy, I said, y'all ask this guy, man, if he knew if he has marijuana. So they asked him in Spanish. I didn't know what it meant at that time, but they say, oh, yeah, como esta? Donde esta su mota? Like that. And the guy said, follow me. <laughs> so we followed him. <laughs> he followed him. So we followed him went down the side street. When we pull up, I told him, go talk to him. If he's serious, then y'all call me. I'm going to come talk to him like that. So. Mm -hmm. So they, they flag for me, they beckon for me. I, I go over there and I talk to the guy and they told me the prices he wanted from. So the, the first guy wanted to charge me like eight, nine hundred dollars a pound. But this guy here, four hundred a pound. I said, yes, this is more like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I said, this, this, this is it. So I told him, look, we're going offshore, man. I said, when we come back in, I'm going to come see you like that. He gave me his beeper number and everything. And sure enough, when they came home, I called him. I 
I said, I'm on my way. Man, by myself, by myself, renegading. <laughs> I bought like, I took all the money I made all show, bought like 10 pounds of oh, weed. And he front me like five pounds, put it in my trunk, and went all the way from Houston all the way to New Orleans. I did that wow. continually until I got up to like 100 pounds of marijuana buying it with my own cash. Jeez. And you're just like driving, you're just driving yourself. Just driving myself. Wow. Taking, That's taking gutsy, like dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. And, and this I, is I when like the like, whole war on drugs thing started too. What this, the whole war right. on drugs was happening too. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's gutsy, bro. Man, now it's like you know, I'm driving trunk full of marijuana, smelling like a, a marijuana factory. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this you know, this young and wild, man. Just just doing it, you know. Trying, this this is all I know right now, you know. I don't, uh -huh. I don't went to war. I done went to the federal. I did my time in Pensacola, Florida. Okay. From there uh, to working, leaving at my job, going offshore, going through the divorce. I mean, I went through a lot in a short period of time. Right. I couldn't meet my wife, couldn't see eye to eye once I came back from prison. You know, we couldn't, we was at each other through, you know. So I changed, she changed, she went, she got more independent and I, she, and I couldn't handle it. So, yeah. Right. It's work. <laughs> um, so I'm actually doing all this on my own, meeting more people, friends, and that's in the drug game. And just before I know it, I left the hundred pounds of weed. I, I left it at that. I started buying. He introduced me to cocaine. When he okay. introduced me to cocaine, and and that's when I started buying one key, two keys. I got to the point where I'm buying 10, 15 keys with my own money. You know, so I have. Yeah, so I was I was spending, I was spending like, uh, like every week I was spending like over two hundred thousand dollars on cocaine. Yeah, and you're probably you're probably chopping that up and like making like at least double that. And and think about it, I wasn't even Damn. chopping it up. I was selling it just like I was getting it pure, like ninety eight percent. Okay, we wow. chopped it up. So that's why I pretty much and I was I was getting it for fourteen thousand. Selling it for seventeen five, eighteen thousand, you know. So okay. I was just making four, five thousand out of each each kick. So go do the math. I was doing pretty good. Yeah, that's not bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do this, people listening. Don't try this at home. We're about to find out why. <laughs> right. Don't do this. <laughs> yeah. Everything that shine ain't gold. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's right. Now now, uh, how long did you go before you ended up getting like this? You ended up getting busted for for traffic. Not too long. <laughs> Not too long. Not too long. Because okay. uh, actually, I got busted in 1998. So I started. I started this like like end of the end of '96. Uh -huh. So I had like a a good year run. I had a I had a I had a good I had a good time. I don't regret nothing. I don't regret anything. I really enjoyed. I had a lot of money. Had cars, you know. I had my house. I mean, uh -huh. I was doing good. You know, I was young. You know, I had a, I had a minor league football team. I was by myself, and I was a part owner of an uh, E and E construction company. So I had a construction company. You know, so I was trying to make. I was trying to clean what I had dirty. Okay. So, you know, so I was in that process, and don't know what I was doing. Yeah, just just doing this, reading on it and hearing and trying to go on that. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of all that, that's when I get popped. I get popped. They kick my door in and come get me, my family, and and lock up. I had 22 co-defendants. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So Jeez. Now did they try to they try to like separate separate you guys or did they trial you all together? Well, of course, they trialed us all together. The judge she mentioned uh, in the beginning, she said, "Don't to all the lawyers and everything we had." It was a big court. She said, "Do not try to get out my court because I'm doing all y'all together." Okay, it's like that. So wow. that was her word. So we had her for the first two years. Two and a half years actually fighting in the parish jail 
You know, that's how it that's how long it took for them to really bring us to trial. Two okay. and a half years. So I'm already on federal for, um, probation as it is. So I had a hole on me, so I couldn't go anywhere. Even though I had a million and a half buying on me, I wasn't going anywhere regardless. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> um, so we got to the point where people start uh, flipping, talking. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's when they start separating everybody. Mm -hmm. you see, so now they're playing mind games with everybody, trying to get everybody to flip on each other. You see? Right, right. Yeah. So, so unfortunately, my old lady at the time and the, another uh, chick that I was mess uh, had with me uh, testified me on trial. So I did. My trial lasted three days, but it took like with an uh, additional day. That one day was just picking jury selection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, they tried to get me to talk in the beginning for three years. They offered me three years. Then they came back, offered me seven years to talk. I wouldn't want to talk for three years. What am I to talk for seven years for? Wow. And then, then they came and said, well, I got a good deal for you, my lawyer. I got a good deal for you today. I said, what's that deal? I said, 20 years, 20 years. So I didn't understand what 20 years was. Was Because in affairs, you do 85% of that. You're doing 18 years and some months on 20 years. Not doing, I'm calculating from that perspective. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, I said, well, my son going to be graduating college and married and probably had kids before I come home. I said, no, I ain't taking 20. I'm going to take my chances and trial. Okay. You see? So I had to, I said, once talk, I'm going to, when y'all say talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to face them face to face and we're going to see what happened from there. Mm -hmm. You know, so sure enough, they, I faced them. <laughs> 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 you know, they pointed to me. Yeah. That's, that's him. That's John Esteen. <laughs> well, it's, like, it's real. Motherfuckers. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> you know, but I understand, you know, I, I took it. I, I know I bit that bullet, you know, I understand. I forgive him, you know, um, you know, because I was doing wrong, you know, mm -hmm. so things, what, what, what happened was meant to happen. That's how I look at it, you know, so, and um, now, but the time that I did do, it changed me as a person. I think it mm -hmm. took that for me, for God to get my attention, to straighten my life up, to find out what direction I'm going in life. You know, right. So, yeah. Now, now the trial goes on and everything, and you hear a 150 year sentence. Like, what goes through your mind? Because I went, I got popped for a Dewey. And the judge sentenced me to ninety year or ninety weeks, and I about fainted in the courtroom. So, <laughs> you by the second person told me that, but I fainted in the courtroom. They got like a couple of weeks. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> wow, man, I could do that on my head, you know, handstand, you know. So, right. <laughs> but uh, when I heard that, but mind you, this though, I did. I was already incarcerated two and a half years at this point. Mm -hmm. I found God. I'm preaching the word of God inside the, the parish prison. So I really was built up for that moment, spiritually speaking. Right. And talked to my mom about God, thanks to God. So, you know, they, they listened to me like, wow, this dude was a curse like a sailor. Now you're talking about Jesus, <laughs> you know? Right. So I can imagine what's going through their mind when I'm talking to my mom or my dad on the phone because all, I, all my conversation is by God. Even my, my daddy, he, when he came visit me and brought some family come visit me while I was in Angola, he told them, my mama told me later, but he told them, he said, look, y'all gonna see Boosie and I'm gonna let y'all know now. He's gonna talk about God, so get ready. You know, mm -hmm. that's 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 the person I become. You see, yeah. that's what I became. So when it so back to this, you know, with the judge sentenced me to 150 years, it was like I was already my lawyer told me if, if I go to trial, if get if found guilty, I mean, I mean, if you found guilty, the judge is gonna send you to 150 years. He told me that because mm -hmm. I'm gonna take the 20. And I said, well, you know, let's let's just strap the boots up and let's go to war. You know, so I'm used to war. Let's fight. I come right. from Saudi Arabia. I went to war, so is this no different? You know, mm -hmm. so my life's still on the line. That's how I looked at it. You know, let's go. I'm taking my chances because, you know, I got a chance I can whip because you know he never caught me with any drugs. I never was caught with any drugs. Okay. You know, besides from, and the phone conversation, I was really on no one's convers uh, phone conversations. 
the, out of thousands of conversations, I was only on with two or three and wasn't saying much. So I knew all this. So right. I said, well, I really took my chances. But you know how to, with Jefferson Parish, some parishes is rough in Louisiana. They they want you, they, they're going to do their best to get you. That's mm -hmm. that's the bottom line. And that's what happened with me. You know, So they made they used me as an example and they made sure they got me no matter what. So, right um, now, now you're you're in prison for a count like a, for life. Your rest of your life, yeah. you're thinking the rest right. of your life, and right. uh, you're able to appeal. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, what happens in into the appeal where you're trying to get a lesser sentence? Pale. I was trying to, I was trying to win outright. I was trying to let okay. them note that you have no evidence on me. You see. Um, you denied me uh, my rights by not giving me a speedy trial. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's a lot of things that I was fighting at that time, but it went on to deaf ears. Believe that. Oh yeah. And not to forget, because you did ask me how I felt with the 150 years too. I don't want. I want to fully exhaust that too, because I think that's important for people to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, because when it when I felt it, is that it's like my mama helped me big time with this. Okay. When I got when I when it read out the 150 years, it didn't feel real to me at that time. But my mama, when everybody walked out that courtroom, when it's all said and done, my mama walked toward, towards me, close as she can come, while I'm sitting in that box, and she says, "Son, your your fight has just begun." A little glimmer of hope there, huh? Yes, and she let me know that. Look, she with me. You know, you you got to fight this. Yeah, and I'm supporting you. That's why that 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 one statement I got all that out of it. Mm -hmm. You see, but no. Nah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's yeah, that's crazy. Like 100, 150 years, but you mm -hmm. you end up appealing, and you end up getting a uh, fifty years knocked off. So you're only in there for a hundred years now, which is kind of like a big slap in the face. You're like, okay, <laughs> you come the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's crazy, man. That's I you see, I my let me tell you this. I'm fighting my case. I'm in I'm already in jail for how many years? About 18 years now, or 17 years, you know, around that around that number. Uh -huh. Um I've been I've been fighting since 2010. You know, uh, so I get to the point, the laws changed and that gave me another hope. And the, the, the laws that changed was that, you know, uh, the nonviolent offenders, certain, certain nonviolent offenders were, you know, I was included in that one. Thank God for that. Right. The, the sentencing guideline has changed, mm -hmm. but it changed. I think it was 2001. It, the law changed, but it didn't go in effect to 2006. Yep. So That's we crazy. really couldn't fight it until about 2010 because we don't know what the law really was about because it really we really had no access to the law in prison. Yeah, it's not like the guards are coming up and telling you what's going on. Like, hey, you guys can appeal now. Hey, hey, you guys, hey, get out. You guys can get out of here. It's not like <laughs> right. the guards are going up. They're like, hey, guys, get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> right. And the thing about it is that the law that changed is made my sentence illegal because it became retroactive five years later. After they okay. changed the law, then it made it retroactive. Now I have an illegal sentence. So I'm fighting it. And as I was fighting it, I come to find out that my situation, it would make the law, it makes the law not applicable to me. Mm -hmm. It was for people, I must I'm a second offender at this point, and I have numbers. The right. law was fitting those who are third and fourth offenders or more okay. with a life sentence. So I meet, I meet neither criteria. Right. So I'm like, wow. I say a worse class offender get the benefit, and I must, and I can't reap the benefit of this. Mm -hmm. So I went to fighting. That's when I really went to fighting. Talking to people and inmate councils and trying to get trying to get the understanding of this. Right. Once I got the understanding, and the key factor to understanding all this was learning the uh 
the executive branch, the uh, judicial branch, executive branch, understanding their position, what they what their job descriptions are. Mm -hmm. So once I figured that out, and I come to realize that, wait a minute, hold up, I have a legal sentence. Why am I going on the executive branch for the on the part and parole board? That's the executive branch. Right. Why? You know, and I'm asking these I'm asking this question to a lot of people. And they say, man, it's just the way it is in Louisiana. I said, no, that's not the law. <laughs> okay, I, what, 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 the law what here. Man, man. You know, that's <laughs> not the law, man. He said, boosted, man. People fought that for many years, man. They couldn't. Big time lawyers fought that and, and they lost. You can't win, man. I say, We'll make you wow. think. We'll make you think different, Boosie. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a second offender, and I have numbers. That would make me different. These people are life sentence, man, and third or fourth offenders. Mm -hmm. You know, they get they reaping this benefit, so they got to go on a part and part and parole board to get their freedom. Right. They got to go on a part and parole board. So I can't even go on a part and parole board. So what I did, I filed anyway. I filed anyway. Okay. That was part of my fight right there. So I want you to, sh I want the system to tell me that it doesn't fit me. Mm -hmm. Then when they give me that answer, that's my exhibit, exhibit A, exhibit B, whatever the case may be. And they bless me with a letter behind that. When they give me a letter, say, well, you don't fit because you're a second offender with numbers. Man, give me that. I want that. Yep. Then give me a letter explaining it. Give me that too. I want all that. So now right. I can go back to court saying that I have a legal sentence, but I can't reap y'all benefit of the new law because of this. Bam, check that out. So I'm fighting, you know. And uh, yeah. long story short, we all know what happened. Eventually, I went to I went to Louisiana Supreme Court, got denied the first time. Okay. So the dissent that the judge, the chief justice gave, pretty much put me in the right perspective of my fight. Or where I need direction, I need to go in, you know. So once I got that and I put it in my new writ, my new motions, the language that I found in the Louisiana Supreme Court decision, mm -hmm. I felt more confident now. I said, well, if the lower courts does not honor this, I will wind up going back to Louisiana Supreme Court using their language, and we we'll see what happened then. You know, so we mm -hmm. see, and now if they don't give me no no act right now. I know Louisiana is really corrupt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yeah, yeah. Louisiana fucked up from what you're telling me, bro. Man, it's it's crazy. It's crazy, man. Yeah. Um. So, I so sure enough, um, I go the lower courts, the appeal, the the appellate um process, all that denied me. Here I go back to um, Louisiana Supreme Court. I've been there 17 months before I got any decision, man. So I pretty much forgot about it. I had a motion in the Supreme Court. Wow. And I think about it from time to time, but that's almost gone on two years that I've been waiting on the decision. Wow. Jesus. See? And that's really a, really a bad sign because they, they don't care about you. Oh, that ain't nothing. They'll just put it on the side, you know? Right. You take that long, they nine time, nine out of ten times you get denied. So I say, wow, I say, I, that's my last hope, man. Louisiana Supreme Court, you know, I can't really go too further because that's a state remedy, that's a state uh, problem fighting, you know. I can't go to feds like talking about, you know. Right. So I say, man. So one day I'm walking on to work, and um, some inmates come on the walk, say, man. Congratulations, Esteem. I said, Congratulations. What you talking about? He said, Man, I heard they ruled on your case. And you got it. And you granted your um your writ, your writ in the uh, Supreme Court. I said, hmm. not that. I said, What what is what is about? He told me and they, they got it kind of wrong. So I said, No, nah, that's not my case. So I just went to work. Went to right. work, man. Came wow. back. About the same two, three guys approached me and said, man, that's you, man. That's your case, man. You won, man. I said, huh? So what I do, I go call mama. You know, I say, ma. I say, for some, uh, I say, ma, they saying that my case, I want my case. My mom got quiet on the phone and she said, they're right, son. Man, I start crying on the phone right there. 
Wow. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. crazy. So, right. so you're a free man at this point. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> close. Damn close. Not yet. Remember, no. remember I got I resentenced to 100 years, right? Okay. Yep. So that's, nah, I, I could have, nah, should have been a free man at this point. Okay. Okay. Because so we're not there yet. All right. I'm not there yet. <laughs> okay. But, you know, I'm fighting the more linear penalty phase right here. So okay. the changes, remember, the changes sentencing guidelines on the Ivana charges where you can get some daylight and go home. They're sending them home. Okay. So now open a door for a whole bunch of other inmates. They gone home. It was freedom for them. Gotcha. It, 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 they fit the new law. If we could third and fourth offenders were life sentences, that's what it was for. So I busted all open. You don't go on a part and parole board any longer. You go to your back, you go to the judicial where you got sentence at, and the judge resentenced you. So now it's back in the judge's hand. You see? Gotcha. So, to but keep in mind, more lenient penalty. I'm supposed to get the more lenient penalty. So what she could have done, my judge, what she could have done. Is ran all my four counts together and gave me the the bigger of the four. Okay. Okay. Which probably would have been 20 years, which I did 20 years. I would have got credit for time served. I wouldn't have been on the pro or anything. I went home like everybody else went home. So my mm -hmm. case set uh at least a minimum of 50 plus people free of my case did. It set precedence of law and uh it's still setting people free today. And uh that's but, awesome. But yes, and the judge wouldn't. She wouldn't let me talk in court. She, uh, my judge, tried to get her uh, to look at my mitigating factors. The last twenty years in prison, all the things I have done, mm -hmm. she refused that. She said, "I'm not a one man part and parole board." She said, "You will have. We have all reached our boundaries. We are here for sentencing, and that's that's what we're here for today. Sentencing. Wow, and." <laughs> Man, she, I, I, I pretty much got her upset though because you know kind of response I gave her, you know, and she stand, she went out there. I'm talking to my lawyer in front of. I said, my lawyer really didn't understand my case because it's new, so I'm trying to help him, and she gets upset. She said she stopped the court and she looked at me. First time she looked at me and, t and told me, "Look, do you want to talk to your your lawyer? If you want to talk to your lawyer, let me know, and I go to the judge's chamber." And yeah. let's talk to your lawyer. Now, what you want to do? I said, I want to talk to my lawyer. So what she did, she took off storming, running, taking, I saw her take off her robe, running to the judge, chain, upset. You know, I, at this point, it didn't matter because I'm trying to, I'm trying to get my freedom. Uh-huh. You see, it didn't matter to me. So she come back, <laughs> sure enough, and, you know, y'all ready for citizen? I said, well, my, my, everybody, DA, yeah, the judge, my a lawyer, yeah, you know, so she sent it to me. She said, well, uh, when she sent it to me, she said, uh, due to the nature of my crime and all this and that, that's 20 years ago, you know, the nature of my crime, you know, um, <clears throat> non-violent at that. Um, right. Uh, I have to send this you to, um, a hundred, a hundred years. Bam. Sent me, man, it sent me back up the river, man. Back, back to Angola. It's like that. So yeah. I'm like, man, now what? I got a hundred years. I just knocked off 50 years. What's the, what's, what's the difference, you know? But I was eligible. I was eligible for parole, but I I been had the eligibility, but I just didn't want to depend on it. Right. But when I get back to Angola, and for some apparent reason, I wound up on the most recent um, part of parole board that came. So it's like one thing bad happened, and something good just had transpired for me. You know. So I'm on the board. I got. Um, Matt Sledge it was the uh, news reporter for uh, the Advocate newspaper in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. He did an article on me in the newspaper, NBC Dateline. They got a went to my story mm -hmm. and they start following it. They came interview me in Angola as well. Mm -hmm. So, and NBC De Dateline, they went, I mean, they came to my dorm and filmed and talked wow. to me. Yeah, I, and, I see. Yeah, I yeah. seen that. I, I had to watch that episode. I was like, "Wow, where can I find this episode?" And uh, it was it was kind of funny because, like, I think it was uh, one of the past interviews you did. I heard that 
it was kind of like Dateline that kind of sprung open your your case for you to for you to like uh, appeal or get parole and leave. Well, actually, it was it was a newspaper reporter. He first one came in there. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, he uh, Matt Sledge. I, I, uh, he's an awesome man. Uh, he came in there and interviewed me, and he my paper my story hit the newspapers. You know, because mm-hmm. when I won it. He, he came along when I won my case in the Louisiana Supreme Court. So he put all that in a, in the paper. If you Google my name, you, you'll see all the all, uh, articles. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, that you will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> SD um, versus the versus Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. I've seen them all. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so uh, so he really he really set the stage for me as for uh, gaining my freedom through the part and parole board. And then when Aunt, when Aunt NBC Dateline came to Angola, Aunt, they came to do a uh, a documentary on Angola, uh-huh. not me. Now, that, I wasn't nowhere in the picture of this. Okay. But when they got there, they stumbled upon my story when they got to Angola. You know, see, so that's okay. when the wardens of the facility they they sent for me to be to meet, come to the uh, the office, and they said, look. NBC Dateline here wants to talk to you. You want to talk to him? I said, yeah, I want to talk to him. Like, Hell yeah, I want to talk yeah. to him. <laughs> yes, I want to talk to him. And now, and then they got the date for my parole. I told them about the date for my parole and everything. So they started doing a story on me. And they came back. They came back for my the, the morning of me going to my parole hearing. They came. Wow. And they filmed me from my dorm. They walked me all the way to the parole hearing. Yeah, you know, they couldn't go in there, but oh, they, okay. they walked me to the door where I walked in. They filmed me going in there. My family I'm holding the door open for my family going there, mm-hmm. and uh, and they was there for me when I come out there with the decision. So I mean, everybody and their mama knew that mm-hmm. NBC Dateline was there for me, you know. So it was a it was a plus plus. I know how it's going to be negative or it's going to be positive because. You know, politicians don't want no kind of bad rap on them if they deliver an inmate and it's what is well known that he they delivering him or they keep kept him in prison. So now mm-hmm. ten times they like to keep people in prison, you know. You know, uh, but this particular time it, it went in my favor. So it was awesome, man. Yeah. It was awesome. And you walk out a free man. Now, how long did it take for you to actually leave? Cause you, I know, like you get, you get like, okay, you're a free man, and then they put you back in your cell, and you're in there for like a week or two, and then you're like, okay, now you can go. <laughs> yes, um, I know guys that have been there for months after that. You know, wow. um, I think I pretty much broke the record because after they said that they grant my parole, I was going home in two days afterwards. Nice. I just had to do the paperwork, go to the medical. You know, make sure everything's sh- check out with me and and let me go away and walk out. Wait where my family waiting for me at. Yeah. Right outside that gate. Yeah, I right saw that part that too. Gate. That was that was yeah, that was emotional. I teared up a little bit when I saw that. Yeah, like, just that was, imagine what he's feeling right now, just walking outside right. that gate after right. like twenty years, twenty plus years. Right. No. Right. No, right. you're twenty you're 20 plus years in, you walk outside, you're free man for the first time. And what's the first thing you do? Well, we, NBC Dateline actually said, well, what you want to eat, man? (laughs) (laughs) It's all on us to everybody. I said, well, I never had, I I love uh, McDonald's French fries, man. They said, McDonald's French fries? I said, yes. So they brought me to McDonald's and they bought me apple pies. Uh, what's that? A Big Mac over there? Yeah, <laughs> some of the pound with cheese. I mean, they just give me anything I wanted, man. And the funny thing about all that is that going to use the bathroom, man. I didn't know that you have to walk off and it and flush automatically. So oh, I'm the motion the same, the motion detector. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm looking at the. I'm trying to find a button or a flusher on it. I'm trying to find this thing, and they found that very amusing. <laughs> <laughs> what's What's really funny is when you walk up to like the sink to wash your hands, and it's motion detected, and you can't get it to turn on. You're just like, motherfucker! 
<laughs> man, I thought, man, it felt like I, I just, you know, like the time just surpassed me. And it's like I'm in another, like I'm in a foreign country, man. Like, mm-hmm. what's going on, you know? So everything looked the same, but it's not the same. Yeah. Uh, this thing. Then I saw this sign on the McDonald's. You can order from there, or you can go to the desk, the counter, and order. Yep. So I thought that that sign, I thought that was a robot, man. I thought it was a robot. I thought it moves or something, but it was a stationary sign. <laughs> <laughs> you go up there and start talking to it. I'm like, hey. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm just looking at it. I wait for it to move. <laughs> I said, what is that? <laughs> What's he going to do? <laughs> just hide yeah, it. What's crazy. Doing? <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's crazy, dude. Uh, so I, I heard that you're, we still have a few more minutes to kill if it's not, okay. if it's if you're all right with that. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, now I heard you're a big into sports, basketball, football, mm-hmm. boxing. Now, I wanted to, I want to dabble into this real quick. The Jake Paul fight. Did you see that? No. Okay. Good. Because it was terrible. It didn't happen, huh? Already. But not not with um uh, Mayweather, huh? No, that's the Logan Paul. Yeah, Logan Paul and Mayweather okay. are on. I seen I believe, Jake Paul fight. next month. Yes, I seen it. Yeah. I seen it. I seen Jake Paul fight. Yes, I did. Yeah. What right. What do you think of Jake Paul trying to be a, a professional boxer? Well, oh, uh, it makes me want to go try my hands after 50, after being fifty three years old. <laughs> start throwing hands. I said, if they can do it, I can do it. You know, but uh, you know, I mean the. It's an exhibition, okay. You know, so I'm looking at it as because when I, I fought, I boxed in that, uh, Angola for many years, right. And even though we fight amongst uh, a lot of guys that are professional, that did the fight professional street, got caught up and went to prison. Uh, I spar these guys, I fight these guys, and so I mean they are all professional, but our fights are exhibitions. It's nothing but exhibitions, you know. So right. I understand it from that point of view. It's an exhibition. Mm-hmm. And they're making a lot of money doing it. And so I mean, go for it. Go for right. it, man. You know, I mean right. if you if you feel that you learned the art of, of of boxing to the point where you can give people their money's worth, well, all right, well, go for it. But I want I mean that's yet to be seen. I want because right. we got what Logan Paul, Logan fighting uh, Mayweather. Yeah, he's a bigger, he's a bigger fight, he's a bigger guy, so way bigger, yeah. And he's bigger than um, Mayweather. So Mayweather is this. I mean, it doesn't matter. You know, if it's not, as long as he's not too much bigger, it doesn't really matter because mm-hmm. of his uh, Mayweather experience. And I, because I, I sparred, I mean, super heavyweights in Angola. And I, and I whipped some of them guys, man. And um, that look, I look like David and Goliath. One guy said, man, you look like little David and fighting Goliath, man. And you whipped okay. that dude, man. Yep. But it's because it's, you know how to protect yourself. Mm-hmm. So if you know how to protect yourself, then it's just art. You know, it's not that bad. And I think I played football all my life, and and I think um, boxing I have nothing as it's not close as dangerous as football. Oh no, like football, you're like head on collisions with people. Man. Like I've been punched in the face in the head like many many times, and I'm okay. Yeah, I mean, but if you're like go head on first, straight on first with like collision with somebody else, dude, yes, that's hey. That's that takes a toll on your body, and you you know sometimes you don't feel it when you hit somebody right. You don't really feel it, mm-hmm. but you but down the line, it takes its toll. You know you know you've been in you've been in something. You know it's like a car wreck, man. You know every time you hit, man. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's pretty. But boxing is um I really enjoy boxing. I like the, like I love somebody who's fighting and don't hold. I like to see the they, they gifts, they talents. I like to see their defense. I like to see their offense. I like to see them how they move in the ring. You know, like Mayweather is a prime example of that. You know, he don't mm-hmm. hold unless he get in trouble. But most time, he's really punching and moving and in and out and round. I mean, that's it's just it's art. You know, yeah. you won't see that beauty on in the ring. You know. Yeah. yeah, I think I think if Mayweather can make uh, McGregor look good in the boxing ring, he's gonna make Logan Paul look pretty good too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I really. think it's all it's really. all it's all for show. I have Mayweather's yeah. gonna win, of yeah. course. Execution. He's not gonna knock anybody out. No, no. Nah. Yeah. It'd be kind of cool good. if something does like that accidentally happens, like Mayweather slips right. up and knocks him out. Mm-hmm. That'd be kind of cool. Right. Now uh, <laughs> uh, we're gonna switch gears to the for to uh, basketball real quick. Uh, mm-hmm. Favorite team. 
My favorite team. Oh, man. I, I, man, believe it or not, I know we have our basketball te team here in New Orleans. I love them. I really, I never really got into it. Um, but I loved Michael Jordan, man. Oh, Chicago. Chicago. I, I love those Bulls, man. When he was there, he was mm -hmm. fascinating. I, lo I really loved him. Um, and the Lakers. I love the, I love the Lakers, you know. Uh oh, what what you got? All right, all right. Yeah, I can't take. I have my headphones on, but I can't take it yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Wow. All right, I love them, man. Yep. They just they just great organizations. I mean, they might hit their lows, but they always snap back. Yep, they always snap back, man. One time or another, you know, just they're just great organizations. You know, so yeah, that's why I always tell everybody, you know, like it was a rough seven years, but we're mm -hmm. back. Right. But look at him back. Yep. Look at him back. That's how it man. is. And uh, real quick, real quick, favorite football team? New Orleans Saints. New Orleans Saints. <laughs> New Orleans Saints, man. I got What do you go think about Drew Brees retiring? Man, you know, uh, well, I think if Drew think it's time for him, I, I agree with him. You know, I, I'm going to go with Drew because he knows himself, his body more than, better than anybody else. And – I felt that, you know, the guy that uh, was backing him up, that was playing slot back and also a quarterback, mm -hmm. um, they put him in for the long bomb throws. I don't think – I think Drew Brees has lost a little of that, that distance and um, throwing his ball. So, really put the Saints at a disadvantage. Right. And uh, I believe that uh, Drew Brees knew that. And I, feel, I think he did that to retire to give the Saints a better uh, – Another uh, to start start a, a new to get the uh, ball ball team back where they need to be. But I hope I hope um, Drew Brees um, coach or something, man, be a part of the the, the quarterback core or something. You know, I would <laughs> exactly. love that. <laughs> yeah, that would that would be crazy. That yeah. would be crazy. Now, uh, uh, real quick, uh, we're gonna talk. I want to talk about your uh, podcast that you have out. Okay, out of bondage and into success. Yep. Uh, I had dropped my first uh, episode. Uh, only thing that's hindered me now is my learning curve, technolo te technically speaking. Okay. Um, it's kind of discouraging at time because uh, this stuff is new to me. You right. know, I, I mean, it's it's like, you know, uh, foreign, but I'm getting it. I'm determined. And I did an interview with Tyron Matthew mother. Tyron okay. Matthew played for the Kansas City Chief. Wow. Uh, I, that was my first interview, and she did. Man, she was, she made me look good, you know. So, <laughs> um, but she had a wedge in a relationship for okay. years, and she was crying out for a relationship with her son. That was the bigger picture of it all. Mm -hmm. And weeks, a week, not even, and not even a week and a half after the it dropped, Tyron Matthew came knocking at her door, man. To reconcile wow. the relationship, man. So they, you know, he even tweeted about it. You know, they got his mind. Might see his mom and his, you know, how he's feeling now, but have his mom back in his life. You know, so it was a beautiful thing to talk to his mother, to see how she felt about it now, mm -hmm. and 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 she he told her one thing that stuck out to me that he had told her that man, look, you my heart, you my baby, you always was. You know, I'm sorry. You know, from what I heard. From uh, from your brother, which is her, his uncle, about stuff about his mom. He never was raised by his mom, but she always was in his life. Right. And, um, so they kind of got that straight, and he's straightened up with him, and he said he got to go straight out with his sister, which I went to his sister's birthday party. She just made 30, so I went to her birthday party. had an all-white birthday party. It was real nice. We enjoyed that. You know, mm -hmm. it was real nice. Um, but uh, I'm glad to see. I don't know if he heard this show. Oh, she asked him if she heard my uh, podcast, mm -hmm. and he said he never heard it. But I think I told her if he didn't hear it, and somebody may have told him about it, if he didn't, you know. But if not heard at all, I think that it was an act of God that it was from your faith, mm -hmm. you know, that you really want that relationship. You went out to the point that, that, that to reach out to him publicly, and God honored that for you. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just that act that you did, 
You know, you never say nothing bad about them, despite of whatever how you felt at that moment. You, you kept it clean, and there you have it. Now you got your relationship back with your son. Right. So, yeah, that's that's amazing. But that is amazing. And I found I found his podcast over on Twitter. It's okay. like that's where I found it. And I follow you on Twitter. So whenever I see it, if you want to okay. post if you want to post an episode on Twitter, whenever I see it, I'm going to I'll share it directly to Facebook. And all awesome. That I appreciate that, man. Not a problem. Appreciate Not a problem. Yes, I want to oh, go ahead. I say yes, oh. sir. <laughs> oh, OK. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank you for coming on, John Estien, for, real quick. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us. Um, yes. I didn't tell you before. I wanted to save this to the end, but you are my 50th episode. So, yay! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we, yeah. Made it, we made it to 50. So, awesome. uh, that on my back, I guess, awesome. because I work hard at this. And mm -hmm. thank you so much again for coming on and sharing your story. And everyone, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Um, go ahead and go check out oopscaughtmesmoking.com. It's where you can watch, listen, and shop all in the same spot. And John, take a minute. Shout out who you want to shout out. Yes. Uh, uh, tell these people where to find you. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you all. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram and on Facebook at the present moment. Uh, out of bondage into success podcast and the purpose of this is to the law of the recidivism and to bring the community back together as one so everybody work together we can be a beautiful place that's that's, <laughs> yes. yep, that's exactly right the world would be a beautiful place if we all work together that's all there is yeah. to it all right guys i love you stay up Peace. <laughs> Peace out. Scene one, Apple, take one. <laughs> what time is it? You want to get high? That's right. <laughs>